Okay, book of Colossians, uh, Colossians for Beginners. This is lesson number seven in that series, uh, chapter two, uh, beginning in verse 15. That's where we are. So last time in our last lesson, we started the section where Paul explains the preeminence of Christ's doctrine, his teachings. Um, I did say to you that this letter is being sent in order to respond and refute false teachers, false doctrine. Uh, these uh, individuals have crept into the church at Colossae and begun teaching something contrary uh, to the gospel. Paul is responding to them. As we saw last week, uh, these false teachers were trying to displace Christ and His doctrines with a, a, a mixture of ideas from different sources. Usually false doctrines like that. You know, it grabs ideas from different places, tries to you know, you know, blend them into Christianity. For example, there was the pagan idea that various spirits, and in this particular case they were saying angels, the idea that various spirits were responsible for the manipulation and the care of the creation and should somehow be honored or worshiped for this activity. There was also an insistence that in order to be acceptable to God, one had to observe uh, Jewish traditions and the Jewish law, uh, especially the requirement to be circumcised. So it was a mixture, you know, a mixture of pagan ideas, some Jewish ideas, and you know, mix all these together into a, uh, what they were saying, a new and improved uh, gospel. So the false teachers, the Judaizers, as they were called, were boasting that their Jewish heritage, of which circumcision was some kind of badge of honor, and their insight into these supposedly new religious mysteries made them superior in some way to the Gentiles. You, know, you want to be religious, you want like high class religion like that we have, well you have to do what we tell you to do. That was kind of the, the attitude. So they used this attitude and teaching about angels and circumcision requirements to try and draw the Gentiles away from their faith and their dependence only in Christ and their faith in Christ for their salvation. So in this letter, Paul responds in several ways. First of all, he shows that Jesus and only Jesus is the link between God and man. You know, Jesus created the world for His purpose and He maintains it. And the point is, not the angels. He doesn't talk too much about the angels like Paul doesn't, but he understands that this is a, an element in this false teaching. So to kind of counter this, he said, look, Jesus is the one. The world was created by Jesus. The world is sustained by Jesus. You're saved by Jesus. In other words, Jesus is the link you know, between God and man at every point. You don't need angels. Angels are not there to, angels don't do any of this, this stuff. They, they don't sustain the world. Jesus sustains the world because it was created for Him, by Him, through Him, for His purpose. Okay? Secondly, um, Jesus has demonstrated that as far as doctrine is concerned, every mystery or every revelation that God has made to man, He has made it through Jesus Christ. Paul says that if you believe in Jesus Christ, you have the key that will unlock every mystery of heavenly wisdom and knowledge that there is. You want to understand the parables? Well, you have, to, you have to accept that Jesus is the Son of God. Then you'll understand what the parables are about. You want to understand the prophets? Well, then uh, understand the prophets are talking about Jesus and what Jesus came to do. Then you'll understand what the prophets are talking about. So Jesus is the key to all revelation from God. And then three, as far as circumcision is concerned, Paul explains that the circumcision that the Gentiles receive in baptism by Christ is far superior than the fleshly circumcision that the Judaizers are boasting about and want to impose on you. He teaches them that Jesus has cut away their old man of sin and given them the Holy Spirit in baptism. You know, the idea is that's the kind of spiritual circumcision that Jesus gives you. And this spiritual circumcision results in forgiveness and in eternal life. Two things that mere physical circumcision could not and did not accomplish. 
So with this idea, we come to the point where we left off last week, where Paul is explaining that this forgiveness, this cutting away of the old sinful nature in baptism was made possible by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Forgiveness can be offered because sins have been paid for on the cross by His precious blood. So as we continue in this section, Paul is going to give several other things that Christ accomplished with His cross. And he's going to admonish them to not be pulled away from this teaching. So we move to um, chapter two, beginning in uh, verse eight. It says, now verse 15 is the summary or the concluding statement from the passage that we began to study last week. We kind of left off in the middle of it. So let's go back and read that passage again, beginning in verse eight. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in Him you have been made complete, and He is the head over all rule and authority. And in Him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with Him through faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgression and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When He had disarmed the rulers and authorities, He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through Him. So verses eight to 14 were explained last week, and in my view, uh, in my review section, we've just completed. Verse 15 is an additional statement that piles on all of the victories that the cross of Jesus accomplishes. Not just forgiveness and renewal of the sinner's life, not just that, that's plenty, but not just that. In addition to this, victory over the unseen forces that war against God and man in trying to destroy the church and block man's entry into the church. You know, the, the, the game, the battle, uh, of the spirits, uh, you know, uh, what, what Paul talks about, you know, in the unseen world, you know, the battle isn't flesh and blood, it's in the unseen world. What is the battle? What's going on there? Well, what's going on, he says, is that these unseen spirits are trying to block people from entry into the church. Why? Because into the church is safety. Into the church is sal salvation. So victory over the unseen forces that war against God and man in trying to destroy the church and block man's entry into the church. So Paul uses a Gentile image here or an image familiar to Gentiles. To make a display of your vanquished enemy was very much a Roman tradition and one that the Gentiles would understand. When a returning Roman general would be victorious in war, he would return to a hero's welcome and a parade along the main promenade in the city of Rome. That was his you know, you know, you know, victory parades, right? New York Yankees win the World Series. You know, what happens? They, they get a, a victory parade. Well, the, the soldiers, the generals would come back from war. They'd get a victory parade. And at this time, the, you know, the victorious uh, military person would trail behind him the captives and the prizes that he had plundered, even the noblemen that he had conquered. Perhaps it was a king of some other country. Well, he'd, he'd be walking behind him on foot you know, with a chain around his neck like a slave. So Paul uses this kind of imagery to describe Jesus' victory at the cross and the defeat of the spirits and the satanic angels who lost in their effort to possess and destroy mankind because Jesus' blood and His word now protect believers. Of course, His reference is directed towards the false teachers who were pushing the notion of spirits and angels as mediators between God and man. You know, he's saying, hey, forget about the mediators, the angels, the spirits. 
when Jesus died and resurrected from the cross, he, he won a victory and he, all these individuals are trailing behind him. The evil spirits and Satan and the false teachers and all these people, those, he's vanquished all of these people. So no faithful angel or spirit would be in such a position you know, to usurp Christ's word and authority. No, no angel, you know, righteous one anyways, would, would do such a thing. So there were evil spirits and the teachings was, was not much more than magic and doctrines of demons and the occult. You know, to call upon a spirit to manipulate something in the physical world, that's the basic definition of magic. And so they were, they were kind of you know, wrapping this around a, a, a shroud of le, le, legitimacy, the angels, but really what they were saying, they, they, they were telling people that they should pray to spirits, angels in this case, so that their crops would grow, so that their life would be blessed, and so on and so forth, that's magic. So in verse 15, Paul adds one more link in the chain between God and all, of, remember I said you know, there's a link between you know, God and uh, the, the link between uh, God and man is Jesus. The link between the creation is Jesus because He created it. The link between the saved and God, Jesus, because He's the Savior you know, and so on and so you know, He's the head of the church. All these links, Jesus is the link that links man and God at every point. Well, He adds another link. And the other link is that Jesus is the link with God as a divine person. He's the link with creation as its creator. He is the link with mankind as man's savior. He's the link with the church as its head. And finally, Paul says, he's even the link with the underworld because he is now the conqueror of the underworld. He's even the link with the false prophets and the demons and so on and so forth. Not that he is in league with them, but he has defeated them. So now that Paul has finally or firmly established Jesus as the preeminent individual in their spiritual lives and his teachings as the preeminent doctrine to guide them, he warns them of, ver of the various traps set by the false teachers and their doctrines. And uh, nothing has changed. These traps, they, they're still used today. So here are the traps he talks about. First of all, there's the trap of false authority. Because only Christ, only Jesus is the authority. No other authority other than Jesus and other than the authority that He gives. So in verses 16 and 17 he says, therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink. How many religions have the leaders of those religions telling their followers, oh, you can't drink this and you can't eat that and you can't eat that on that certain day and so on and so forth. You know, huh? <laughs> to this day we have religious leaders acting as judges over men and women telling them what they can eat and what they can't eat and so on and so forth. And what does he say? No one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival. You must go to a certain city on a certain day or one time in your life and you've got to worship and you've got to do the pilgrimage. You must do that. If you don't do that, you won't be saved. You won't go to paradise. To this day we have people lording over others what kind of festival that they need to attend or in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new mood. Oh, oh, oh what does it got here? Or a Sabbath? <laughs> a little more familiar, isn't it? We have groups within Christianity that say, no, 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 you need to worship God on the Sabbath, on the Saturday, the Sabbath, because if you don't, you're lost. What does he say right here? No one is to be your judge. Things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Christ is the Lord of the Sabbath. Christ is our food and our drink. Christ is our festival, our rejoicing. 
Every time a religion you know, strips that away from Christ and decides they're going to make this a law or a pillar of their religion, you know, you know that it's wrong. You know that it's going away from the freedom that we have. Somebody said to me, why, why are you a Christian? Because it sets me free, that's why. Because it sets me free. Only Christianity sets the individual free. Every other religion locks him in. Every other one. So in this section we, we catch a glimpse of how the Judaizers were trying to manipulate and dominate these Gentile Christians. Well, what do you think these, uh, these wars are about? These groups within Islam, why do you think they're fighting each other? They want to establish who will have control over the people. That's what this is about. And why do they attack the West? Because they want to dominate the West. Why? Because they despise the idea that in the quote, in the larger sense, the Christian West, freedom, freedom is a most precious gift that we have. They don't like the idea that here in the United States, no politician can tell you who you're going to worship and who you're not going to worship. Because what they want to do is establish themselves as the judges of what you eat, what you drink, where you go, what you do, as far as religion and other things is concerned. So here, if I go back to my micro, that's the macro, but the micro example, these people were setting themselves up as the authority by introducing rules concerning issues over which they had no real authority. Laws on food and drink, which the Jews had in the Old Testament, no pork, the priests were not allowed to drink alcohol when they were serving in the temple, so on and so forth. And the Pharisees, you know, they had raised these to a point of obsessiveness. I mean, the, you know, the Pharisees, the legalists, you know, they were tithing salt, pepper, oregano, if they had it in those days, I don't know. Rules on observing certain feasts, again, that were part of the Jewish culture in the Old Testament, the Passover and Pentecost, or the many obligations uh, concerning the Sabbath, which again were part of the Old Testament laws and traditions, but not bound on Christians. So the false teachers were putting rules and regulations concerning these things, and they were claiming that by following their teachings, the Gentile Christians would become stronger and wiser as Christians. It was the same lie that Satan did. Do you not know? Hasn't the Lord told you if you eat of this fruit, you know how wise you will be? You'll get to know the inside secrets. Same, same seduction. So Paul responds to this by saying that all of the things mentioned, feasts, Sabbath, food laws, and so on and so forth, and every other element in the Jewish religion were a shadow, a kind of a preview of Christ and His work. For example, the sacrifice of animals in worship was a shadow or a preview of the sacrifice that Jesus was making or would make. The special diets that made the Jews unique among the nations pointed to the unique separation from the world that Christian disciples would experience. Everything in the Jewish religion pointed to or foreshadowed the coming of Jesus his life, his death, his resurrection, as well as the establishment and eventual glorification of his church. So these false teachers were trying to convince the Gentile Christians that the shadow was more important than the actual substance of the shadow, which was Jesus Christ. So his admonition is, don't let them act as judge for these things. They are free to do as they please concerning food or festivals or special holy days and so on and so forth. If they have Christ, meaning if by faith they are united to Christ, they have achieved the ultimate religious goal. And all of these other things are secondary and they fall into the realm of personal choice. 
Number two, the trap. So number one trap, false authority. Number two trap, the trap of false spirituality. You know, Christ is the source for complete spirituality. Let's read verse 18 and 19. He says, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and, do not, and, and not holding uh, fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with the growth which is from God. So the prize of course that he talks about is freedom from condemnation due to sin. That's the prize. And the reward of having an eternal relationship with God through Christ because why? Well because our sins are forgiven. So Paul says that Gentile Christians should not allow anyone to deny them this prize, claiming that they are not spiritual enough to deserve it, and basing this denial on their concept of false spirituality. In other words, oh, you're a Christian, you believed, you were baptized, yeah, yeah, well, that's you know, not quite good enough. <laughs> not, not quite. You think you're going to heaven just because you trust Jesus? Well, that's not very spiritual, is it? In the Judaizers' case, their claim to superior spirituality was based on their practices and their claims, which Paul enumerates briefly. He talks about self-abasement, meaning asceticism, you know, wearing you know, a hair shirt or tight belts or not eating any meat or you know, whatever. Vows of abstinence from marriage or certain foods or codes of conduct. They're saying, look how spiritual we are. We don't eat meat. We've foregone marriage. That means we're, we're more spiritual than you are because we deny the body simply for the sake of denying the body. And don't get me wrong, denying the body is not a bad thing. But denying the body to prove that you're spiritually superior to someone else, no, that, that, that <laughs> That, that glorifies no one but yourself. And the worship of angels, discussed previously you know, their concept of the role of angels. Paul says that their only proof for this are personal claims of visions. And these claims create a false sense of spiritual pride in the ones who say they have them. Again, how many modern religions, when I say modern, within the last 100, 200 years, have as their base one person saying they had a vision. They were by themselves and they had a vision. And what they saw and heard in this vision, this is the basis for the religion. And from there on they go. Paul is saying, are you kidding me? That's not legitimate. Paul brings his readers back to the only source for religious authority and spiritual growth. That's God Himself. And by extension, he infers here that since Jesus is divine and part of the Godhead, the only source of authority and teaching that causes the body, meaning the church, Christians, the only source of authority and teaching that causes the church to grow spiritually is Christ, not the false spirituality of the Judaizers. And does that work today, that false spirituality? You, you bet it does. People are just so impressed by someone who forgoes marriage for a lifetime and uses that as a, you know, as a badge of honor for their heightened spirituality. You know, Peter, you know, my answer to that, well, Peter the Apostle, he was pretty spiritual, he was married. You, are you more spiritual than Peter the Apostle? And so in verse 20 to 23, he makes a kind of summary statement here about this, you know, these issues. He says, if you have died with Christ to the elementary principle of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? So Paul asks his readers a question. If you have died to this world, where do we die to this world? Well, in the waters of baptism. That's where I die to this world. 
So if you've died to this world and have risen new creation, well how am I a new creation? Well my sins are forgiven, the Spirit of God lives within me, and I have been guaranteed eternal life. That's, that's a new creation right there. So if you've died to the world, risen as a new creation, why do you think that material things such as that are temporal like food or feasts and human teachings from the Judaizers, why do you think these things will have any effect on you for good or bad? You know, the day I walked out of the waters of baptism, all my sins were forgiven, all of them, forever. And the Spirit came within me, forever. And I was guaranteed eternal life. No matter how long I lived in this world, another two years or another 70 years, I was guaranteed eternal life. Here's my question, who can improve on that? What other religion can add something to that? Who can make me closer to God than I already am through Christ? Well, no one. So you, you, you can't manipulate or improve or destroy spiritual things with physical things. I forgot to read verse 23. Let me just finish that up and I'll continue with my comments. So he's talking you know, uh, things, of, of food or, or feast and so on and so forth. And he makes a parenthetical statement. He says, which all refer to things destined to perish with use. So don't eat this, don't do that. All those things, you know, they're, they're going to be destroyed. In accordance with the commandments and the teaching of men, he says, these are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom, self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. When I was younger, <clears throat> very young, uh, you know, I came out of the Catholic Church, so on and so forth, but I did spend some time in a monastery and I thought maybe at that time, maybe that might be the life for me, contemplative life, being a monk at Augustinian Monastery out in Vancouver, Canada. I spent time there. And I remember just observing, I was still thinking things through, I was reading the Bible, I hadn't quite found you know, the way yet. And usually when you begin searching for God, you begin searching in the religion of your parents, because that's your, you know, your baseline, that's where you start. And so I figured, well, you know, I grew up Catholic, so there must be something there. So let me investigate that all the way, not just casually. Let me just go right to, you know, I mean, becoming a monk. And I spent time there. I'd work in the weekend. I'd go to the monastery on the weekend, spend time. And what I saw in there was, a, was exactly what he's saying here. They were never to marry. They took vows of poverty, meaning that they had no money to themselves. They pooled everything together. They lived in community. They would fast. They went to mass every single morning. You know, this was the life. And the time that I was there, I saw, and I'm not judging now, I'm just saying what I observed. I observed jealousy. I observed gossip. I observed sexual impurity. I observed all the sins there that I saw in the world. And said to myself, well, if they're doing this here, what's the point? There's got to be something else. And I just continued searching. That's what Paul is talking about here. All of this self-abasement and you know, this ritual, this religious ritual, this grandiose type of religiosity, it's, it's no guard against sinfulness and fleshly indulgence. This does not work for that. You, you cannot manipulate or improve or destroy spiritual things with physical things. If you have eternal life through Christ, how can eating or not eating certain food add to this or take away from this? Well, it can't. 
So Paul does admit that from a human perspective, these practices, asceticism, religious festivals, traditions, religious garb, and all that kind of stuff, it seems spiritual. It looks religious to the human fleshly mind. He concludes, however, that none of these things gives one the spiritual power to overcome sin or to be forgiven for sin. Only the blood of Jesus removes the stain of sin. Only the Holy Spirit within the Christian and the word of God can enable the Christian to overcome sin in his life. While I was in the monastery, we did a lot of things. But one thing we never did, I never saw, I'm not saying nobody ever did it, but I never saw, I never had a Bible study there. I went to morning mass, I went to evening vespers, you know, and I'm saying prayer time, you know, I, I, in my room, which was just a little cot and a, a table and a small lamp and a chair, that was the room, there was a missile, you know what a missile is? <laughs> Not a rocket missile, but a missile. It's like a prayer book, a Catholic prayer book, daily prayer book. That's what I had in my room. I, there was no Bible to be seen anywhere. There was never a Bible study. Perhaps during the mass, the priest would read a passage. Today's passage is this, but there was no explanation of what that passage, you know, how to implement that. Now I'm not saying there's never any Bible studies in, in any monastery, no. But in my experience there, the Bible was not the center of the activity. And only resurrection and glorification can free man from sin forever. Not asceticism, not rules, not food or drink laws or religious rituals or false religious teachings. These things do not set us free. So in this section, Paul really focuses on the teachings and the tactics of the false teachers, revealing their basic worthlessness to achieve any spiritual goals. And he also establishes the gospel, the teachings of Christ as preeminent, sufficient, and effective in accomplishing our dearest spiritual desires. And what are our spiritual desires? Well, to be forgiven for sin, to have a clear conscience, to be enlightened spiritually, the beautiful thing about Bible study is that once you understand something that the Bible teaches, that piece of the puzzle stays right there. It doesn't move around. That truth does not change from week to week. People have a desire to know the truth. And people also have a desire to live forever with God. And why do we feel like that? Because God has put that in us. He has created us in such a way that we seek to live eternally. We seek Him. OK, so a couple of modern day lessons from this section, I think, can help Christians maintain their faith in the here and now. So first lesson, um, first lesson is here. Be careful. In every generation, there are religious hucksters who try to build a following using the same gimmicks from 2,000 years ago. The claim that they have a special calling or a vision, or a message from God. But God has given us His final message until the return of Jesus. And the final message is, believe in Jesus and obey His commands. That's the final message. God has given all the miracles and visions and direction to carry out that message to the apostles who have recorded it and preserved it in the New Testament. The only thing we wait for is the return of Christ. Everything else we need to know about God and His will is in this book. There's no other secrets left to be revealed. So be careful. And, and don't, don't be embarrassed to teach your children this, that they be careful, that they pay attention. You're not being narrow-minded if you teach your children that Christianity is the true religion of God. Okay? You're not being narrow-minded, you're being wise. Only the devil and the atheists in the world want you to be broad-minded to tell your child. When I hear parents say sometimes, I'm just going to teach them all the religions and just let them make up their minds when they grow old. Really, there's a recipe for disaster. 
right there. So be careful. Number two, be confident. Don't let gurus who starve themselves or never marry or live in caves make you feel unworthy. Religious zealots with a, a one doctrine religion, don't let them make you doubt. New religious movements with lots of publicity, don't let them sweep you up. Criticism or scorn of the Bible, don't let that weaken your faith. If you've been united to Jesus Christ in repentance and baptism, and if you continue to follow Him daily, you are forever a child of God and your salvation is absolutely guaranteed. Nothing you can do or say will make you any more saved. Nothing you can do or say will make you more pleasing to God than the fact that you are faithfully following Jesus. God is pleased with those who believe and obey His Son. This is the ultimate spiritual condition and it's the only way to spiritual growth and eternal life. Be confident in Christ. Don't worry, just believe in Him and know that His promises will be fulfilled to you. All right, well there's uh, Lesson number seven in the series.